You've spelunked into the Matt Cave. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of the Matt Cave. Thank you all so much for spelunking on by. This week, we have a little news from the state of Utah when it comes to sporting. Not much, but it is a big one. I'll go over the Jazz and Laurie Markinen and what that means both for the immediate future and the future future of the franchise. I'll go over how the people who call Utah home did at the Olympics for as far as successes in the medals go. And then lastly, well, IGN stepped in it again. Their reviews just keep getting worse. I don't know. Well, we'll get into it. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you. You are all awesome. Rock stars and spelunkers all rolled into one. As always, if you could rate, review, like, comment, subscribe, wherever it is, however you listen, and then share it around to whoever, I would greatly appreciate it. And special shout out to Neil Jensen. He gave me an awesome review over on Twitter. So thank you, my good sir. And now let's just dive into things. So the Jazz and Laurie Marketing. Like I said last week, they had a deadline of August 6th if the Jazz wanted to remain flexible this next season as far as the trade market is concerned. Over the offseason, towards this deadline, I guess you could call it, they had a lot of conversations about a possible move, including Laurie Markkinen, with the Golden State Warriors, the San Antonio Spurs, Sacramento Kings. That was about it. The Knicks kind of sniffed around a little bit. But overall, there was nothing that really moved the needle for Justin Zanuck and company. And it always felt like a deal was going to get done. And I'm going to attack this from a couple of angles. So the first angle is the asking price for Laurie Markkinen was set so high on purpose. Justin Zanuck, Danny Ainge, they knew they held all the cards here. And so what they were doing is they were trying to get another Donovan Mitchell-esque haul for Laurie Markkinen. But the only way that Laurie Markkinen would have wanted to do that would have been through a sign-and-trade. And the reason why Laurie Markkinen was so attractive to all of these teams that were sniffing around is because he was on an expiring deal and it wouldn't break their bank. So it was actually really smart with what the brain trust with the Jazz was doing with Laurie because... If they got one of those deals that you just can't turn down, that would be another wow moment. It would push out the rebuild further because there's no marquee player. Like the best player on the roster would then become Jordan Clarkson. And that's never good news. Jordan Clarkson's a wonderful human being, but he's not an all-star and he's not going to carry your team into the playoffs. So that's kind of where it started. The reason why I was confident Laurie Markkinen was going to stay in Utah also is because he loves it here. He's one of the rare, rare players. Him and Jordan Clarkson are in rarefied air because they are bona fide NBA players who enjoy living in Utah. And for whatever reason, NBA players don't like it here. I've I've covered it in past episodes. I'm not going to cover it again. But it's not a hub for NBA talent. Charles Barkley has explained why. You can go find that out. And Russell Westbrook has his issues with the state. Although, him and Ryan Smith must be very good buddies because Ryan Smith has cut some fat checks for Russell Westbrook the past few years. My goodness. So that's kind of where we're at because Laurie Markin wanted to stay here. He has, he has his family here. He loves it here. There's winter sports here. The ho- you know We just got a hockey club. And so it just feels like a wonderful place for him to continue to grow both as a player and as a dad and as a human. And so that's basically been his messaging the whole time. And it felt more genuine than other stars in the past. You know, like your Gordon Haywards, Darren Williams is all the way to Andre Kirilenko's where they say the right thing, but it always felt like they were just saying the right thing. You know what I mean? So that's where we're sitting with Laurie Markin and we get a deal. The deal is done. The ink has dried. What does this mean? Well, first, the deal. 
The deal is for five years and funny money at two hundred and thirty-eight million dollars. So that it's it's not the max max that Larry Markkinen could have demanded were he to let his contract run out and then become an unrestricted free agent after next season. But it also leaves some wiggle room for the Jazz to further fill out the roster, which they did. They got. Um, Zvi Mikhailuk or something like that from Boston. Uh, they signed him to a two-year deal, I believe, maybe three-year deal. And then they still need to sign Kyle Filipowski, who is the highest drafted player remaining to be unsigned. I think he's the only rookie from this rookie class to be remained unsigned, so they kind of need to step on the gas there because we're getting close to training camp. But overall, this is a good move, I think. And the reason why is they signed it on August 7th. The reason why August 6th was a key date was because you are ineligible to trade a player until six months have elapsed from when you signed their contract. So six months from August 6th would be the trade deadline in February, fe- uh, February 6th. So this means Laurie Markkinen is locked in for the Jazz at least for one full season. So no trade rumors, nothing of the like there. He just gets to concentrate on playing ball. Which, like, for the first time since he got traded to Utah, he really gets to just focus on that. His name will not be in trade talks. He will not be bandied about. He's in Utah. Same can't be said about Jordan Clarkson, but there we go. And the national nightmare for Jazz fans, Talon Horton Tucker, is gone. They renounced his rights. He's now a free agent, and it does not look like the Jazz intend on re-signing him just because there's so much young talent that the Jazz need to evaluate. So they don't want to take minutes away from these guys like Keontae George, Bryce Sensabaugh, Taylor Hendricks. They don't want to take minutes away from them anymore with veterans that they're just going to trade at the deadline. You know, guys like Kelly Olenek and stuff like that. So overall, I give it an A. I do. Both sides got what they wanted. Laurie Markkinen just to gets, gets to play ball and hang out. He's not going to be in trade talks. The Jazz have their, I guess, centerpiece for now. Obviously, this team's not making the playoffs this year. It, it's just not. Unless something dramatic happens where the bottom half of the Western Conference playoff teams from last season completely collapse and the floor goes out from under them. Teams like Golden State, the Lakers, Clippers, stuff like that. And then the Jazz's young talent matures faster than anybody thinks possible. Keontae George becomes an all-star. You know, Cody Williams is the guy. He is that wing guy the Jazz have been searching for basically since they've existed. While it's possible, it's not very probable. It's not going to happen, and the Jazz will be in the lottery. The good news there is the Jazz have a lot of at-bats in the lottery to get a top three pick, and Cooper Flag is the real deal. The reports out of the U.S. men's basketball team training camp before they went to, I believe it was Abu Dhabi, for exhibition games was that Cooper Flag brought it to the veterans. He took it to them. And the veterans were impressed. Veterans like Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard. They were all impressed. Devin Booker was impressed. So he is the real deal. He'll probably be the number one overall pick in this next draft. That means that's what the Jazz are gunning for. He's not Victor Wembanyama. He's not paradigm altering, but he is a clear franchise altering talent. Not NBA altering, but franchise altering. That's the guy. So the Jazz want him. So this season is going to be rough. Jazz fans expect it to be rough. Like I've said the past, basically since they traded Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell, it's going to be rough. But what you need to do is you need to look out for the small victories. You need to look for games where Keontae George has a positive assist to turnover ratio, where Larry Markinen dominates, scores 30 points, he gets a double-double. Walker Kessler gets double-digit blocks. You know, root for the small wins and continue to root for the team. Never boo your own team. Ever. I hate it when fans boo their own team. That's why I stopped being a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I couldn't stand it when Eagles fans would boo their own team. I get it. You're frustrated. But those guys on the field, it's not like they're not trying. Those guys on the court, they're, they're playing their guts out. So don't boo them. You can boo the front office. You can boo the coaching staff. Just don't boo the players as they walk off the court or the field. Okay? Not okay. 
express your discomfort, your anger, your displeasure, whatever you want to call it, on social media, direct it at the front offices, not the social media folks. That's fine. Just don't boo the players. So this season, yes, very rough for the Jazz. I don't expect them to win more than, I would say, 30 games this year. There's going to be a lot of young talent put on the floor. Guys like Jordan Clarkson will probably get traded just because his contract is very amenable to teams and teams love instant offense. I don't want to see Jordan Clarkson go. I'd rather see him finish out his career in Utah. But I feel like he deserves a ring because he is that good of a human being. And so... That's kind of where we're at. I would love to see him get shipped off to a contender like the Bucks, like, you know, the Cavaliers even, because I think he deserves a ring because he is that cool of a guy. And you, if, you, if you doubt that, look at how much money he's donated just to local businesses in the area of Salt Lake City. He saved a couple of food trucks, and he did that awesome interview at the Gateway where the reporter had no idea who he was. She was very polite, very sweet. And he respond, and she asked him if he had been to a few jazz games. And he said, yeah, I go pretty regularly. He played along. He didn't go, you don't know who I am. He played along. I love that. That's very rare in the NBA these days. So that's why I would love to see Jordan Clarkson get a ring. Whether it's with the jazz or not, it probably would never be with the jazz, just based on the timeline. But it would be awesome. All right, I, I digressed a little bit there but you know you've come to expect that from me so let's move it right along and let's talk about the locals from utah at the olympics there were a lot of them i covered a few the ones that i mentioned a few weeks ago were the ones that were born and raised in utah not necessarily the ones who call utah home so that's my bad i missed a lot but i'll learn for 2026 and the winter olympics so here we go so we have grant fisher Originally born in Michigan, but he calls Park City, Utah his home, and he trains here. And he won bronze twice in the 5,000-meter and 10,000-meter track events, and he wasn't expected to medal in either. It was awesome to watch him run. In the 5,000-meter, he chased down the top three. He was never going to catch the guy in first. That guy was insane. But he actually almost chased down for silver. So that's awesome. And then we have two women from the Rugby Sevens who are the story of the Olympics. I don't care. Simone Biles winning gold. Awesome. Amazing. That gymnastics team winning gold. That's a great story. U.S. men's national team getting into the knockout stage in the Olympics for the first time in a third of my life. That was a pretty cool story. But I mean, come on. Come on. Coast to coast hero Alex Cedric is from Harriman, Utah. Harriman. Yeah. Most of us who have lived in Utah our entire lives couldn't even point to where Harriman would be on a map. But she was the hero, and she's from Harriman. And that's awesome. She won bronze. So did Steph Rovetti. She was also on the Rugby Sevens team. Big shout out to that rugby women's team. So awesome. I hope there's momentum for the sport from that. And not just the Olympic push that happens for these these sports where it's like a couple of months people are interested and then the interest dies away. I hope that's not the case for rugby because I actually learned how to watch rugby from watching the women's rugby sevens team. I didn't even watch any of the men's stuff. I didn't really have a rooting interest. The U S men's team was not that great this year, but they are getting better. They were shut out twice, but they were shut out against like Australia. So that's not bad. The women beat Australia for a bronze medal. And watching them was insanely fun. So I really do hope that there is momentum for the sport from that. Because honestly, I didn't believe it when rugby fans would tell me it's actually safer than American football. Because I was like, no, it's not. It's like the same thing, only you guys don't have pads or helmets. Well, actually, it is safer. Because there's no high hits allowed. You can only tackle from the front. You can't pull them down from behind. And there's no blocking. The only people that can hit each other are the ones going for the person on the ball. That's it. So it is safer. I I apologize to all of my friends in the past who said rugby safer, and I brushed them off saying, you're nuts. You're correct. And it's fun to watch when you finally understand what's happening. Even when you don't understand what's happening and you have a rooting interest like your country is playing, it's still fun to watch. But the announcers that NBC had 
did a, such a wonderful job explaining what was happening to a layman like myself that I was able to understand what was happening and I enjoyed it. And I was up and screaming when when Alex Cedric was running. She hit the truck stick and just boom, turbo on, she was gone. So cool. But moving on, we have Sam Watson who won speed climbing bronze. I think he set a world record in that one. So congratulations to him. He was actually pretty bummed out because he didn't get into the gold medal meet, I guess. I don't know what you call it. Race off, climb off. Well, I don't know. But he more than made up for it by getting a world record in the bronze medal. So I props to him. Kenneth Rooks won the steeplechase silver in the 3,000 meters. If you haven't watched the steeplechase, um, there was a very, very scary incident in the steeplechase where I believe it was an Ethiopian runner mistimed his jump, his foot caught on the hurdle, and it spun him so that his head clocked off the mat. He was out. It was ragdoll. He was done. And it was scary. So, But he's he's okay. It was just a massive concussion, but he is okay. It was, but it was scary. So Sam Watson won silver in that race. <laughs> or not Sam Watson. Excuse me. Kenneth Rooks won silver in that. Sam Watson was who we were talking about previously winning that speed climbing bronze. And Brooke Rabautu, I really hope I pronounced your name right. If I didn't, crucify me, please. She won silver in the women's combined sport climbing, only coming up short to the defending gold medalist. So big props to Brooke as well. So in all, that was six people who call Utah home winning Olympic medals. That's awesome. Like for me growing up, like in 2002, it was Peekaboo Street. If anybody remembers her, she was from Utah. There was actually a street named after her because she won a medal at the 2002 games. So we do care about our Olympics in this state. We really do. And it was fun to watch those people who called Utah home do so well. And with Grant Fisher, and I can't remember the program he's in. I think it's the Running Elite or something like that. Distance running in the U.S. is only going to get better. And they, the best ones move to higher elevations. So Colorado, Utah, uh, some in Montana to get better lungs, you know, be to, so they can do these long races. So keep an eye out in 2028 in L.A. There could be a few guys from Utah in that that might be able to medal higher than bronze, especially Grant Fisher. So overall, that was such a fun Olympics. I hope you all enjoyed watching it. Politics and opinions aside, it was so much fun watching all of it from the swimming, gymnastics, even to the stuff we don't understand that well in the States, like archery, shooting. What was it? Synchronized swimming? I I can't remember what it's called now, but that's basically what it was. That was fun. The women, the U.S. women got silver in that. Like, we came out of nowhere in so many different things. Weightlifting, we got a gold medal. Wrestling, we got a gold medal. Cycling, we got a gold medal crazy, crazy stuff. And then the U.S. women, I mean, this might sound patronizing, but thank you. You carried the men in this Olympics, and it was so much fun to watch. Shakari Richardson, Sydney McLaughlin-Verone, Gabby Thomas, they're superheroes. There's nothing else you can say. They are superheroes. Because if you watch that 4x400 relay, once... Gabby Thomas and Sydney McLaughlin Verone got the baton. It was over. It was was over. It was done so. There was was nothing those other countries could do. It was like a full five seconds before second place got across the line. So massive kudos to the women this year. And the men, well, you got work to do, guys. I mean, I will always defend Noah Lyles. I love Noah. Noah Lyles. I stand Noah Lyles. Okay. Asthma. So bad that he basically couldn't breathe. He had to be in the hospital. He fought through it. He became the fastest man in the world with the world championships. He got the 100 meter. And then he got COVID. And for us mortals, asthma 
plus COVID-19 plus a 102 degree fever would equal a hospital bed. Not Noah Lyles. You know what that equaled for him in the 200 meter? A freaking bronze medal. Like, anyone who says anything negative about Noah Lyles, I will... I Well, I'm not an online tough guy, so... But it just makes me roll my eyes and just go like, you just don't... Un- you don't get it. You, you don't understand. And I am a huge Noah Lyles fan. I will be rooting for him to get back into it in L.A., and have him sweep every event he's going to be in. I know the men are pretty ticked off. I know Carl Lewis in particular is ticked off with how a lot of the men performed in track. So that's going to be different in four years. And Michael Phelps isn't too pleased with the men either in swimming. We had a lot of silvers and bronze. We lost to Australia in a lot of races, which is never okay in swimming. There's going to be a lot of competition coming up for LA 2028, and I cannot wait. Those Olympics are going to be awesome. The Olympic team for the U.S. is going to be performing with their hair on fire. It's going to be great. And who knows? Maybe the U.S. men's team can get something done. The the World Cup is in 2026. There's going to be a lot of young talent coming up. Maybe they can do something on home soil. Who knows? But overall, successful, successful games. You know, controversies and tragedies aside it was a very successful games and I can't wait for 2026 in Italy for the winter and then 2028 in LA alright lastly let's kind of move on to a website that I used to have a lot of respect for but that respect has disappeared since I've started reviewing games on my own and that is IGN my goodness it's not very good anymore yes they missed a lot of stuff when it comes to off the field things like mascots and cheering and like the crowd doing different things but they got so much of it right the bar I believe that IGN was setting for this was way too high You've got to know that this team that created this game was playing at a disadvantage. They couldn't use a single scrap of the stuff they had from their mo- from the last NCAA game, NCAA football 2014. They couldn't use any of it. It was locked away behind the lawsuit that name, image, and likeness, all of that kind of stemmed from. They couldn't use any of it. So it was from scratch that they've been doing this. And a lot of the team kind of had to do it while working on other projects too because this is not, or at least it wasn't, it is now, but it wasn't one of the major moneymakers. Like EA knew there was a passionate fan base for this game, the college football games. They know. It just didn't make the money of a FIFA, of a Madden, of any of their other EA properties like Battlefield and stuff like that. And so that's one of the reasons lawsuit aside that they kind of let it taper off but now that it's back EA understands how important this is to all of us and I'm just glad it's back honestly when it comes to an, a mega publisher like EA just look at what Sony is doing to the Helldivers 2 publishing house what they just did to the to Bungie if you are unaware Sony just laid off almost I would say about 50 to 60% of the team at Bungie after the massive success that the final shape was. And now they are canceling projects left and right. The sequel to Destiny 2 has been canceled. It's not a thing anymore. Marathon, the brand new IP coming from Bungie, is in danger of getting canceled. New content for Destiny 2 is a question mark because a lot of the team has been laid off. So if you are a mega publisher, shame on you, first of all, because all you do is lay people off just so you can impress the board with how much money you saved from laying people off, and then you can give those C-suite people a big raise that they don't deserve because they don't do anything, but the people who do do stuff are now looking for jobs, scrambling, stressed out for their lives because you needed that big old bonus at the end of the year. 
Shame on you. But when it comes to big publishers like EA, uh, this game never should have happened. Honestly, never should have happened. Because EA only cares about the money makers. So obviously FIFA, and that has now become EAFC, Madden, those games make money for them. Straight hand over fist money because of Ultimate Team. And so in order for EA to pay attention, this team that made college football had to introduce an Ultimate Team of some sort. It is by far the least popular mode of anything. There's a poll on IGN. There's 12,500 votes on it. 70.5% of that vote says they're playing Dynasty. 22% is the next highest playing Road to Glory, where you create your own player and you kind of go through being a college athlete. The next closest after that is Play Now, where you just pick up the game and play. Ultimate Team is at 3%. Nobody cares about the Ultimate Team. The people that care about it are streamers who have the disposable income to just throw stupid money at this game mode. It's a game mode that should not exist. But this team had to throw it in to get EA to go, all right, fine. But the game itself, IGN gave this game a 7 out of town. That is way too low. If you remember, if you recall, my review is get it. Buy it. You'll enjoy the game. And I stand by that. I have played put so many hours into this game across PlayStation and Xbox that I don't want to say the amount of time. And I've done Dynasty modes with random schools. Like, I'm doing one right now with Kent State on Xbox. And then on PlayStation, I started at New Mexico State, and I'm now the offensive coordinator at Ole Miss. Like, give me a break. This game is great. 8 out of 10. Easy. And that's very low as far as I'm concerned. I would give it a 9. And they're only going to make it better with updates as we go along the season. They're already adding more jerseys. They're adding players that have come out of the transfer portal and are now on teams. They update rosters, so people like Ben Bywater will now be removed from the game because he was forced to medically retire. And then they'll add additional environment to the game. They have already updated University of Kansas Stadium to finish it off. Like it was under construction when they were making the game. Now that it's pretty much done, they can you can see how it looks. Same thing with Vanderbilt Stadium. They're going to be doing updates to get it done. Like it's not a finished product. This isn't a time capsule anymore like it was in the past. And so they are they're treating it like a live service game almost. So the review, I'm not going to name the guy cuz I don't think that's fair. But the review short-sighted and just a little bit unfair. You can't, I think he went in with too high of expectations, which is not fair when you're a review. When you do a review, you don't go in with expectations. This is this is you know the gospel according to Matt. You don't go in with any expectations of a game. When you review a game, you go in and you just experience it which is why it's so hard for me on certain titles like World of Warcraft, for example. World of Warcraft, Pokemon, Borderlands, college football. I have my preconceived notions. I have my biases. And I let you guys know. I say, I love this game series, so take this with a grain of salt. But if I go into a game that I don't have any sort of bias against, like Elden Ring, for example. Elden Ring... I was a little against even because it was made by From Software. They make games hard. It's kind of their thing. Elden Ring is a masterpiece. It's a 10 out of 10. Get it. If you can, just get it. It's a masterpiece. Going into the game, I had no preconceived, no notions, no biases other than I think it's going to be hard, so I'll, I'll be prepared for that. But other than that, I don't know what I'm getting into. That's how you should review a game. You shouldn't get into the previews. You shouldn't get, even, get into the leaks. And I like to think that I'm very good at that. I don't look at leaks. I don't really do gameplay footage stuff before the game comes out. I want a fresh perspective. And if I look at any of that, I'll get a bias. It's it's just human nature. And so I think the guy who reviewed it for IGN came in with a couple of biases, whether it was against EA or something else. But he did give it a 7, which is better than any Madden game has gotten in the past 10 years. So there's that. 
All right, everybody, that's the show this week. Thank you all so much for being here and spelunking on by. I will be back next week, and over the next couple of weeks, I will be doing my in-depth, deep dives for BYU-Utah and Utah State for the college football preview before the season kicks off here in two weeks. Two weeks! We've got college football. I told you that this year was going to be great because we had, obviously, NFL wrapping up, NBA wrapping up, and then we got into spring training, but then the good stuff started, right? Euro, Copa America, and then we had the Olympics, and now we're getting into college football and pro football kicking off, and then we get into October where it's baseball playoffs, MLS playoffs. Like, this is a good year for sports. Next year, it's going to feel so boring because we have none of that. We have, like, World Cup qualifying in Europe, but that's about it. Next year's going to be boring. <laughs> I'll try to not I'll try to make it not boring for you all. But thank you all for being here and I will see you all next week when we spelunk back into the Matt Cave. <laughs>